Okay, folks. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Rosenmayer, and I'm going to be tonight's moderator. This is Fidelco's first interactive presentation with our, featuring our clients. So please bear with us because we're new at this and we may have a dog or two or a grandchild wandering through. <laughs> but we're delighted to have you joining us tonight. Um, for those of you who, who are friends of Fidelco's, and for those of you who are new, I just want to mention that the mission of Fidelco Guide Dog Foundation is to provide people who are blind with expertly bred German Shepherd guide dogs. Every seven minutes, someone in the United States goes blind. So many of the things that we take for granted, like when a light turns green in an intersection, or putting toothpaste on a toothbrush, or figuring out where a hotel room is, or navigating a strange city. These are all challenges that people with visual impairment must tackle and master. And some can rely on a four-footed partner to help them meet these challenges. Since 1981, Fidelco has trained and placed more than 1,500 guide, uh, German Shepherd guide dog teams across North America. Fidelco remains inspired by its exceptional clients, two of whom are with us here tonight. So I want to introduce Phil McGalnick. Phil, you want to say hi? Good evening. Thank you for having Chloe and I here tonight, and we look forward to participating and hopefully shedding some light on our experience as a team working together. Thank you. Phil is, is a Stanford native, a retired member of the Stanford Police Department, a father, a civil rights activist, and not only the proud partner of Chloe, who can be seen in the bottom of the screen, that's his Fidelco teammate, but he is also a puppy raiser, training the next generation of guide dogs. He co-hosts his own show on public access TV um, called The Crosswalk. So this may not be the first time you're seeing him on the screen, but we're very happy that he's on this one. Um, we are also delighted to have Lynn Merrill with us. Lynn, can you say hi? Hi, uh, yes, I can say hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for asking me. I'm humbled to be on this first podcast, and I think we're going to have a good time. I think you're right. Just to let everyone know, Lynn is on her fourth guide dog, all from Fidelco. Lynn is a mother, a hospital administrator, a very active grandmother. We saw her granddaughter photobombing our practice session yesterday. So she has a lot of stamina. She's a force of nature, a trailblazer, and an activist. I know you will enjoy hearing from both Phil and Lynn. Um, there's one more person we're going to hear from. Each Fidelco German Shepherd guide dog takes about two years thousands of hours and tens of thousands of dollars to breed, train, and place. Thanks solely to the generosity of donors, the indefatigable work of staff and volunteers, all Fidelco guide dogs are given to clients at no cost. How are these remarkable animals bred, trained, and placed? Some consider guide dogs the sort of PhDs of service dogs. Well, tonight we are fortunate to have with us Chris Eastwood. He will tell us a bit about the remarkable training for both dogs and humans that goes into the making of each guide dog team. Chris, it's great to have you here. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm happy to be here. Chris, maybe you could start out by telling people how you became involved with Fidelco. Sure, yeah. I think everyone comes to Fidelco from a different walk of life, but I was fortunate enough to get involved with Fidelco originally by signing up to be a volunteer puppy raiser. And then, long story short, I adopted a Fidelco do guide dog um, or a dog that was bred to be a Fidelco guide dog that was dropped from the program as a, and I adopted her as a pet dog. And that's sort of my introduction to the organization. After um, adopting that dog that was bred by Fidelco as a pet dog, I pursued a, um, what's the 
word, um, opportunity to pursue the apprenticeship position and completed the three-year apprenticeship program and became a qualified trainer instructor. So now I am a, uh, I'm a qualified guide dog trainer instructor and specifically my position at Fidelco is uh, currently a placement specialist. So what that means is I specialize specifically in uh, matching and finishing guide dogs that are coming through the program and then placing them with our blind clients that are accepted and waiting. T tell me a little bit about the phases of training. How, how long does it take to train a guide dog? What are the stages? Yeah, absolutely. So at Fidelco, you know, as a high level sort of overview, um, Fidelco breeds all of the German Shepherds that, um, that we place and all of the dogs are born on our campus in Bloomfield, Connecticut. At about eight weeks old, the puppies go home to a volunteer puppy raiser family. For about the first year and a half of the dog's life, they are raised by a volunteer puppy raiser family, which is a incredible service by our volunteer base. At about a year and a half old, the dogs will come in for formal guide dog evaluation and training. So at, at about one and, one and a half years old, the dog will begin their formal guide dog training and they're going to be in the guide dog training program for about six to nine months per dog. And it's, it's different for each and every single dog because they're all individuals just like us. So some dogs can learn things a little bit faster than others, but um, just because it takes a dog a little bit longer to pick up the content doesn't make it any less of a dog at all. At about uh, two years old, the dog will graduate from the guide dog program be matched and then placed in the community of a Fidelco applicant that is accepted and waiting. So, so I have a question about that because you're kind of the matchmaker. One of them, it's actually, you know, the entire training staff participates in the matchmaking process. As a placement specialist, uh, it's definitely going to be my responsibility to help match the dogs with the applicants that are accepted and waiting, and then place that dog with the individual. Yeah. So, so what goes into your decision-making when you're trying to figure out which dog should be paired with whom? Sure, yeah, so at Fidelco, we have dogs that have the aptitude to be successful in all kinds of different circumstances and environments. So. For example, we might have a dog that graduates the program that may have attributes or personality traits that indicates that it will be successful in a more rural or suburban environment. And then we have dogs that have attributes that indicate that it might be most successful in an urban environment and everything in between which is just like our client base. You know, we service individuals that live in the city, in the suburbs, and in the country, and everything in between. So it's really important that we have dogs that fit each and every single one of those different needs. So I, I think it's the training that these dogs go through is very specific. Can you tell us a little bit about, I think you teach them something called intelligent disobedience? Yeah, sure. We'll, well, we teach the dogs many different skills, uh, aside from fundamental obedience, of course, uh, which the dog is always going to be responsible for completing, uh, just like any other dog. But we, we also teach the dog um, things like, uh, well, fundamental guide dog work, moving forward through the environment, being mindful of obstacle clearance, getting the blind handler around obstacles that exist in the environment, traffic safety, um, escalators, elevators, stairs, find the counter, find the seat, find inside, find outside, uh, find the bus, find the elevator, etc. cetera. Um, I think what you're mentioning uh, right now, specifically about the intelligent disobedience, it really is something that 
applies to traffic safety, which is one of the most important uh, aspects of a guide dog's responsibility, right? Um, so talking about the, the term, uh, the terms intelligent disobedience, that's when um, if we are walking down the sidewalk and we come to a, a street crossing and we tell the dog to go forward at an unsafe time, perhaps there's a, a Prius or an electric car that we're, we're not audibly aware of, or maybe there's ambient noise in the environment that obstructs our ability to really hear what's going on very well. Um, if, if the blind handler tells the dog to go forward at an unsafe time, the dog is taught to disobey that particular command in that moment. And then as an instructor, we have taught our students to follow and to trust the dog and to not step out in front of them. And that's how, as a team, our guide teams can navigate their environments safe, safely, sustainably. That's a pretty remarkable feature of a, of a guide dog because it's the only dog I know of that's supposed to countermand a command if yeah. it's, it's dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe one of the most uh, critical aspects of owning and operating a guide dog, right? I mean, it's um, definitely a big deal if, we're, if we are um, navigating traffic safety and um, we tell a dog to go forward. You know, we're humans. We make mistakes uh, just like everyone else. So if we accidentally tell a dog to go forward in an unsafe time, you know, the dog has a redundancy plan trained into it to, um, you know, make sure that we adhere to safety protocol. So tell me a little bit about community team training, because I think that's, that's one of the unique features of Fidelco, that instead of bringing clients to you, you go to where the client is. Yeah, absolutely. So Fidelco is unique in not just the breed train and place exclusively German Shepherd guide dogs for people who are visually impaired, but we also do what's called in-community placements. So unlike most other guide dog organizations that might have a dormitory situation uh, where students can come and learn on campus and, and learn with their peers, and in, with, at Fidelco, an instructor will come out to you, stay in a hotel near your home, and work with you each and every single day for 10 days if you have had a guide dog from us in the past, 12 days if you've had a guide dog in the past, but not a Fidelco dog, and 15 days if you're a first-time guide dog user. So it's very intensive one-on-one -on -one instruction with a guide dog instructor and a new team, but we find that it's very conducive to working not just with the German Shepherd breed, but also having the, the luxury to teach a very specific training to that team that is run to them. So you're really kind of not only training the dog, you also tra train the human who receives the dog. Yeah, I, I would say it's probably heavier on the human training side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. For sure. Um, <laughs> Tell, tell me what it means, the difference for a dog to be in harness and out. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, one of the really fascinating uh, aspects of our work is that we teach the dog to um, associate the presence of the harness on their body with a working state of mind. So that's really important because when a guide dog handler puts the har harness on their dog, their dog is expected to understand that they are going to be held accountable for a long list of cues and commands. Um, conversely, when that harness is removed from the dog, the dog is off duty and no longer working, no longer to be held responsible for the fundamental guide dog work, and they're, they're sort of off duty as a pet dog. But it's really important that the dog understands that when the harness is on them, that they are going to be working and held accountable for that work. 
And dogs, I, I think one of the misconceptions is, is that dogs just want to lay around on a couch. These are working dogs, right? They really want to be doing this. Yeah, for sure. You know, what, I, one interesting thing about these German Shepherds, and this is, I guess, a bit of a stereotype with the German Shepherd breed, but, um, you know, these dogs want to work. They have incredible work ethic. Um, and so much so that if you don't give them enough stimulus and or work that they might find their own job, which might not be the most productive, <laughs> um, something <laughs> like any other pet dog behavior. Uh, but the, the German Shepherds that Fidelco breeds are very much uh, working dogs and they do find the guide dog work in, intrinsically reinforcing. That's terrific. So tell me, what are the most rewarding parts of your job besides going to visit the two of them mm -hmm. and, and, and Phil? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I very much um, appreciate the opportunities to travel around the United States to work with all of our clients. Um, and for me, the, the best part of my, about my position at Fidelco is that I get to be the person that makes that connection between the guide dog and the human and, and really uh, get to see that team come into the nation. Um, it's always going to be in flux forever, but you know, it's my responsibility to set that team up for sustainable success. And I uh, really do appreciate the opportunity to work with each and every single one of our clients. Um, all of them are incredible individuals. So that's, uh, that's my, my privilege. Well, well, from what I understand, I think um, you've also gotten to know some of the clients in different contexts. I believe among Phil's many skills, he's a justice of the peace. That's correct, yes he is. Phil, Phil is a justice of the peace. And uh, I was uh, very fortunate to actually uh, just have a one-year anniversary with my wife, Stephanie. And Phil, last year, about this time, was the Justice of the Peace at our wedding, which was amazing. So I, again, thank you so much, Phil, for, for that. And uh, you know, we... Well, happy anniversary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Phil, tell us a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? Born, raised, school, work, everything in Stanford, Connecticut. Did not fall far from the tree. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when did you first notice that you had vision difficulties? As a youngling, I was aware of uh, clumsiness, not being able to see well in the dark. And um, as I got older, I was really a baseball nut. I was a pitcher from Tiny League, Midget League, Little League, Babe Ruth. And over the years, I noticed that I would pitch the ball fine. But at times, when it came back at me, I would just lose it. So I'd lose a pop-up in the air. I'd be looking around, and I'd have my bacon saved quite a few times. And um, that was really the beginning of it starting to manifest. I have retinitis pigmentosa. I was diagnosed at age 13. But, um, yeah, it just slowly progressed. But it was very impactful. But you were, you were able to work all through this. Absolutely. I didn't retire until my early 40s. Um, I was driving. I had my dream car, Porsche. I was a volunteer wow. firefighter, EMT. Uh, I was fortunate to do 20 years at the Stanford Police Department as a dispatcher, which allowed me to get lazy. I, I really want to go to law school or medical school. But the diagnosis time, the prognosis was you're going to go blind. There was no time frame, and everybody progressed differently. So uh, sad to say I got a little bit lazy, and uh, I was comfortable. But uh, I've made up for that now. So, so when did your, your vision difficulties worsen? Probably late 30s. Late 30s, um, I developed cataracts, which is a side effect of uh, RP. Um, just the night vision totally disappeared. The peripheral vision shrunk in. The acuity started to diminish. And I'm at the point now at age 53 where it's just really light and dark perception. I don't have any usable sight at this time. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about how that affected you in the rest of your life? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, going from the, the tough guy life, police, fire, EMS, that was my whole world. Motorcycles and nice cars and traveling all over the world. And uh, abruptly, you know, it, it just seemed to, I say RP is pretty cruel because you see well and it slowly progresses, but then all of a sudden it's, it whacks you in the face. And like, where did that come from? So my reality was not blindness until I really realized it was time for a change. And uh, it impacted my life in a way that, you know, everything just seemed to stop. And I fell into that pity party for many years and then uh, just crawled out of it with a lot of support from family and friends. So, so and a purpose, yeah. What led you to apply, to decide to apply for a guide dog? Um, you know, I, I think I should have had one way sooner <laughs> than I did. <laughs> and when I applied, I was in transition going, you know, moving and a lot of things. My kids were off to college. So I thought it was me time now. And I had just become an advocate and I wanted to travel and do things. And with the cane, although I was very competent with my cane skills, it didn't give me the freedom to do what I wanted to do or go where I need to go, when I wanted to go. Um, and that's true dependence, you know, doing what you want to do when you can, how you want to do it and so forth. So the dog was a must. And I have a really good friend of mine, a mentor who has had two Fidelco guide dogs and love German Shepherds. And Fidelco is in my backyard. And I uh, broke out in a sweat having someone assist me in uh, completing the application and came down for an interview. And it was like expecting a baby. You were approved. Let's wait now for the, for the dog to come. So it was really a natural progression of me. I needed that to become more dependent. So, so tell me about your first meeting with Chloe. It was quite the emotional day. Um, I had wanted, as you can tell, a nice tough male dog. <laughs> and I received a call from Becky, who ended up being my placement uh, specialist, that we have a perfect dog for you. Um, her name's Chloe. I'd love you to meet her. I'm like, who am I to argue? If you think she's a match, let's do it. And we uh, came around the corner of our building that first Monday of December, 2017. And I had my uh, fiance and her daughter. And we turned the corner and Sarah starts crying already with the video going, there she is, there she is. And I got up, I'm going to get emotional now. Um, you know, I knelt down and she's looking me all over the face. And Becky was like, we've never seen her emotional like that, meaning the dog, not me, I'm always emotional. And um, she's like, what do you think? I go, let's go. And the following Monday, uh, it was game on, training began. So I didn't have an adjustment period. I just knew that, wow, this is so surreal, nothing I would have expected. And I just yeah, let it go, let it happen. So, so tell me about what Chloe, just having Chloe, what, what did that allow you to do? What did that change for you? That was very quickly evident how life-changing it would be. Um, I had lived in an apartment building at the time and the way to the elevator to where I lived was through a garage. And of course, garages are very dark and with RP, I was with a cane like a pinball machine bouncing off pillars and cars. Um, the first week and a half I had Chloe and I was permitted to take her out on my own. She would remember where the elevator was. She would take me up the driveway, through the garage, around the cars, to the elevator, stop. We'd get up to the floor. She'd take me to my apartment door. And I was like, there were no words to express that. And then the following week during the conclusion of my training, um, I asked, hey, let's go out at nighttime. And Becky's like, sure. So she stayed in town. And I grabbed Chloe at the harness. We were downtown Stanford, which is very busy. A lot of traffic, a lot of restaurants, a lot of pedestrian traffic as well. And I don't think I'd ever walked by myself at night, even with a cane. And I grabbed onto Chloe and said, forward. And for, <laughs> I'm do it again. I broke down. Being able to fly down that sidewalk and have Becky behind me saying, you just went around a hydrant, a sign, a mailbox, a car pulling out of a driveway. And you know, Hunter Rod and my fiance was behind me with Sarah again. And it was just a feeling that I, I never experienced. And to trust the dog after two weeks of training to do that. And I know Vicky was behind me, but it, it was just like, wow, this will change because not only is it dark at night, but I go to theaters, I go to government buildings and meetings and other venues where it is dark. And to feel confident enough to 
travel safely like that. It was just mind blowing. Tell me about the, the first trip you ever took with Chloe. Yeah, so I got Chloe, uh, you know, we were all set in the middle of December, 2017. And two months later, I was going down to Washington DC to go to Capitol Hill and do some lobbying uh, with some con lo our congressmen with respect to issues affecting those with disabilities. And I asked, can I take Chloe? And they're like, go for it. And we get on the plane and JFK was a nightmare. And Hardarada was in a wheelchair being helped by an attendant and I had Chloe and we just followed and again, weaving through the crowd, get out to the airplane. She popped down in front of me, didn't make a peep. We landed and we get to the hotel. And after one day, she knew how to get me in and out of the hotel, through the doors, through the lobby, to the elevator, out of the elevator, into our room. I'm like, this is a trick. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, Chris or Beck, you're behind me setting this up. <laughs> it, it was too incredible to happen like that. And we were so great walking through the halls of Congress, you know, touring the Capitol, going to uh, you know, House of Rep buildings and Senate, Senate office buildings. And it just gave me the confidence. And it's also a great icebreaker, um, but it helped me appear as if I knew what I was doing. And my first time at Congress, I was sweating both, but Chloe <laughs> kept me calm. So uh, she, she went to work right away. It was very impressive. And, and you were down there because of your work as an activist. Yes, uh, I am the no, vice president you... of Connecticut. Sure, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I, I'm the vice president of Connecticut National Federation of the Blind and I, uh, president of the local region here of Southwest Connecticut. And uh, what NFB is, is the Civil Rights Movement for the Blind. So I became very heavily involved and I knew that I would need a dog to help me do that. And Chloe has been able to take me from uh, you know, Capitol Hill twice to conventions all over the country, uh, to meetings all over the state, uh, to the Connecticut General Assembly up in Hartford, Connecticut. We've been testifying there. We're very active in local government. So having her with me um, and without assistance getting from point A to point B safely has allowed me to progress with my advocacy and therefore turning on to a public access TV show and she's always on the set sitting in front of me. Uh, it star. just allowed me to do these things. Yeah, she's a star. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about how you got started in your work as an, ad, as an advocate. Yeah, I, I fell into it. And, and I say now to people, you know, everybody wants to help people, but unless you can help yourself, you cannot advocate for others. And I had had some things happen to me where I felt discrimination. I had gone to the government center for some assistance and I had a, a city clerk ask me for proof that I'm blind or proof that I'm disabled. And then I go to a, a library for a business workshop and I'm handed off by the lapel to someone, hey, can you take him upstairs like I'm, like I'm a nothing. So that kind of organically grew my advocacy for myself, which finding out that, hey, I'm not alone. There are you know, hundreds of people in my own community that are disabled and, and need some uh, people speaking up for them. And not everybody can be an advocate. It's difficult to uh, speak up for yourself. People are afraid, they're embarrassed. Uh, we feel often like we can't fight City Hall. We feel that we're, we're the only ones dealing with this, so why make a big stink about it or just forget about it? You know, we'll do, go somewhere else. We won't walk this way, we'll go on another sidewalk. And I don't take that too kindly. So the advocacy part just came naturally from progression as you know, public safety and looking to help people to helping people in a whole other other way. And it's been so fulfilling and to have not only Honorada, but, you know, Chloe by my side has, has changed our lives. So that everyone knows. Right? Yeah, Honorada is my fiance. We met yeah. um, because of Chloe. Um, I had just been approved for a Fidelco guide dog. I got the letter in the mail and I'm using my machine, which I have over here, which reads my mail. And um, I posted on Facebook, I got approved now. It's like an expecting father waiting for the call for the match. And Hanarada and I were in the same Facebook group for our disease. She also has RP. And I get a private message from her about how do I get a guide dog? And I'm like, well, I don't like the message. Let's chat. And because she uses her dog's name, Zula, as her last name, in my screen reader, I use a, a device, an iPhone or a computer that reads the text on the screen. So it's all audible to me. And when it read her name quickly, it was Honorata Zula. And it sounded like a Japanese guy. Um, she calls me and she's not a Japanese guy. <laughs> she lives an hour away. We met three days later for uh, an NFB convention in Connecticut. 
And a week later, we were inseparable. We, we were met. We were engaged that December, um, the following December, and we bought a house two years ago. And that's why we're raising Zen with hopes that he will make it through and become her guide dog. So we're very excited about that. And this is part of us giving back. And if he, it's not a match for her, we would do it again because I'm indebted to Fidelco forever. I can never repay what I've received. Well, it's terrific that you're you're also a puppy raiser for Fidelco. So. Absolutely. And Zen it's tough. is how old is Zen now? Zen is will be 14 months next week, and it gives us the best perspective of both sides. Because when I think how when we met our puppy raiser for the first time, like Chloe's puppy raiser, like how did you give her up? And we hear, and we were exposed now to a lot of puppy raisers and the respect I have for them personally for, you know, now I see what goes into it. It's, it's hard work and you want to have them as a cute little pet, but we know that they're destined to do great things and seeing what goes into it now on the other side of the fence, it, it truly makes us appreciate it so much more. And it, it's, it's tough. And to say goodbye, you know, even for six months of training or six, nine months of training, and we're not sure if we're ever going to see him again. Um, so it, it's a little emotional, but it, it's for a great cause. And if someone can get a dog that does what Chloe does for I, you know, it, it's all worth it. Well, it sounds like it not only has Fidelco provided you with a dog, but you got a lot of romance out of this too. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got, I got everything in my life right now is essentially because of, you know, uh, being involved with Fidelco and the opportunities that they're giving me now to, do some outreach and speak with puppy raisers and you know, give them my side of the story as a handler has just been great. Whether it's marching in a parade with Chloe or attending some local events. And uh, you're, you're also been. very active with the mayor's office for helping um, with accessibility issues for, for other people mm -hmm. who are similarly challenged. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. The Stanford uh, mayor has a uh, task force and we call it Access for All. And I've been on that since the inception six years ago. And with Chloe, it gives me a little more clout. You know, some people see me with a cane and I look like I'm looking around and they'll, they'll always say, well, you look normal, you can't be blind. So Chloe's a good um, uh, prop, I guess, for things. <laughs> but she allows me access to places I probably wouldn't get into because who can say no to her? You know, she's adorable. Well, let me, let me ask, your, your fellow activist, Lynn, a little bit about this, because I understand, Certainly. Lynn, Lynn, you yes. have had four service dogs, all right. from Fidelco, right? That's correct. So, so you are a, a real repeater here. <laughs> I am. You, you had a very full life before needing your first guide dog, right? Yes, I did. Would you like to hear about it? Yes. <laughs> Well, um, I got my first guide dog when I was in my 40s. And I got that dog about five years after I experienced loss of vision. So I had married right out of high school. I had become a new mother uh, just about a year after I got married. My former husband was in the uh, army. He was an active duty soldier. So for 20 years, I was a wife of an active duty soldier and um, had three children and raised my family. During his career, we found ourselves in Germany twice, uh, once for six years and once for seven years. But both times we were right in the city of Frankfurt and our other assignments were in North Carolina and Arizona. So after he retired from the service and we moved back to Augusta, Maine, which was home for both of us, uh, I resumed my career in hospital administration, but it was at that time that I started to develop a loss of vision. And over the next two years, I was uh, trying to find an answer. Uh, my condition really has no diagnosis, but I was followed by Mass Eye and Ear in Boston and Walter Reed in Washington, D.C. and Johns Hopkins in Maryland. And uh, they weren't able to 
give me a diagnosis, but um, after some treatment that they were just guessing at, they were able to stop the progression of my uh, vision loss. So now I have 10 degrees of vision in my right eye, which is, has very little acuity, but it does allow me to detect large objects. Um, I guess I would equate it to if you walked around your house in the middle of the night, you still could kind of pick out where the couch is. Uh, but you wouldn't be able to see anything that's on it. And you could see a person, but you have no idea who they are. Um, so that was what I was left with. So, so when did you first have a guide dog come into your life? I got my first guide dog about five years after I lost my vision. Hmm. And that was in 2001. It was on September 16th, which was less than a week after 9-11. Oh, wow. And um, it, was, it was quite an experience meeting my guide for the first time. Um, I had an approximate arrival time of when the instructor would arrive. So I was sitting in my driveway in a glider swing with my my son's cat at my side and she was just all snuggled into me and then this van backed down the driveway and the instructor got out and opened the back doors and there was Mr. Quig in his kennel and my cat jumped off my lap and ran away and she never talked to me again. <laughs> because she didn't like the instructor nor the horse that she rode in on. <laughs> but um, Quig got out of his kennel and came right over to me and sat down at my left side and just leaned into me as though to say, you're my human. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was it like working with Quig? How did that change things for you? Well, that changed my life in so many ways because, uh, of course, I had to be a competent white cane user, mm -hmm. and I qualified at competency at probably at the grade of D or D minus, um, and I worked in a hospital. So as I navigated the hallways of the hospital, where there were also many elderly and frail patients navigating their way, and uh, walking slowly in the corridors, I periodically would run into one of the patients that I was walking behind because I was walking at a faster pace. And uh, sometimes my cane would trip them, and sometimes I was walking too fast and didn't stop as I felt the obstacle with my cane. And of course, you know, trying to navigate from building to building and room to room, you're using a cane and also groping and trying to find braille signs. And with Quig at my side at work, the first thing I noticed was how much easier and seamless it was to travel from room to room or building to building. And uh, things like going into a conference room for a meeting, instead of having to ask somebody, can you tell me where there's an empty seat? I could just ask Quig to find a seat and he would uh, glide me over to one and point it out and I'd sit down and he would park underneath. Um, similarly, if we were walking through the, the uh, a hospital and came to a crowd of people. If I had my cane, uh, none of them really would notice because most of them were engaged in conversation with others. And so I'd be bumping into heels and soles and mm. making my way through a crowd. But with the guide dog, again, you just seamlessly breeze through those crowds mm -hmm. of people and just continue with your shoulders back and your held, head held high and not having a sense of um, discomfort or uncertainty about your orientation. I understand that one of the things Fidelco does is that it will 
follow you as you going going through life with your service dog. So what happened when you needed another service dog? Uh, Just because when, Queeg re retired, right? Yes, Queeg. Uh, the dogs, when I first got Queeg at that time, the dogs generally worked until they were 10 years old. And, but that wasn't a, a absolute cutoff. My first dog, Quig, worked until he was 12. And he happily worked until he was 12. But then it was time for him to retire. So I applied for a successor dog. And uh, it, it really didn't take long for that particular successor uh, to come. And that was Nerys a small female shepherd. Now, Quig, who I, I didn't mention his size, he was uh, 105 pounds, and he, he could have been a small pony. <laughs> so it was quite remarkable, because I'm not a person of high stature, and uh, me walking along with my horse was always something that I completely enjoyed. Uh, but Nerys was a much smaller dog, um, uh, but still she had, you know, the excellent skills. Uh, it turned out that uh, after a good period of time, we weren't the perfect match that both Fidelco strives to achieve and that I would want in a dog. And so um, we ended up... Uh, succeeding Nerys with Libby, another female. And uh, Libby worked with me until she retired when she was 10. You had a lot of adventures with Libby, I think. Tell, tell us about going to, to college. Well, um, when, after I had retired from uh, my, my official job, I settled into a role of mother and grandmother. I had, uh, in 2001, I think I had five grandchildren. So um, while I loved taking care of my grandchildren and I felt that I was doing something very meaningful, I didn't feel like I was growing. And so I decided to uh, go back to college and complete my degree which really was almost like starting all over again um, because I had only done a few classes in my younger years. So with Libby at my side, we enrolled in college. There were some obstacles there as far as accessibility and um, applying and all of that, but we did get that taken care of. And uh, Libby led me across the floor for commencement, and I was the student commencement speaker. And uh, we, we graduated together. Libby had a mortarboard on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you made quite a team. I understand yeah. that that was not the only <clears throat> challenge that you, you and Libby went on. No, it wasn't. Uh, when I received Libby, she was a three-year-old shepherd. And she was very healthy, very strong. And I was a little bit younger than I am now. And the time seemed right to, to set out on a goal of uh, checking off one of the items on my bucket list. And that was to climb Maine's Mount Katahdin, which is Maine's highest peak and it's also the end of the Appalachian Trail. And it is quite a challenging hike, and hike is really an understatement. <laughs> uh, so I decided to train, and I thought this is the time to do this in my life. I have a young, healthy dog. I'm still feeling very well. I want to do this. So I uh, actually trained for over a year and uh, part of that was because when I scheduled the hike, I had to twice postpone it, um, once because of a broken foot and once because of a torn Achilles tendon. 
as a result of the broken foot. So we finally pulled together the, the date uh, for the hike and I contacted Fidelco and asked them if someone from there would be willing to join my team, mostly in the event that the hike would become too taxing on Libby to have someone who could take her off the mountain in case that that event came up, which it didn't. And Chris uh, jumped right on that opportunity because the outdoors is his middle name. <laughs> and uh, Chris came and joined our team. We were a team of 10 people. Uh, Chris, my son, his wife, another friend. We had two other hikers who also joined us but didn't make it to the peak. And we also had a journalist from Maine who had a weekly television show called Bill Green's Maine. And he uh, told stories uh, about things going on in Maine and Maine's history. So he and his photojournalist also joined us and they did a, a show, an episode on our hike. And he ended up winning an Edward R. Murrow Award for that, that show and was nominated for an Emmy. <laughs> an Emmy. <laughs> but he didn't win the Emmy, but he won the Murrow Award. Was it, how was it, how did you manage it with Libby on a harness while you were trying to hike? Well, um, this is a very strenuous hike for my standards. Um, and there were times when Libby actually had to come out of her harness and either use just her leash or be off leash altogether because sometimes some of the jumps or other things that we had to do were beyond the length of Libby's leash. And, um, it was, it was kind of amusing when Chris advised me to, take the leash off Libby and let her find her own way. He said, she's in her element. <laughs> I said, Chris, Libby has never been off leash before. <laughs> what if she gets lost? How am I going to explain to Fidelco that I lost their dog on a mountain? <laughs> Chris said, I am Fidelco. <laughs> she's in her element and she doesn't let you more than 20 feet out of her sight. He said, don't worry. This is the safest thing to do. Uh, so we did that. And then we used a bandana that Chris had in his hand and I was tethered holding it with my other hand. So Chris became my sighted guide. And um, one of the m more memorable points was when we were jumping from boulder to boulder, literally, and there were, you know, quite large chasms between them. So Chris would be on a boulder in front of me and he would verbally guide me. I also had walking sticks, so they served as similar to white canes. And I'd get my toes to the edge of my boulder and then Chris would take his cane and tap on his boulder. And he'd tap, 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 and he'd say, Lynn, this is where you have to land it. And then he tap, tap, tap again so that I could hear where I've got to go. And then I, you know, take that giant leap of faith and go for it and land it. And then we'd be on to the next one. It sounds then, like you've taken a lot of giant leaps of faith. <laughs> I have taken a lot of giant leaps of faith. Lynn, we, we have a, just a little bit of time. You just won a case on behalf of the visually impaired. Can you, can you describe that? Because you're also quite an advocate. Yes, um, uh, with the elections coming up soon uh, and with primaries behind us back in July and a worldwide pandemic uh, in July during the uh, primary elections that we were having in Maine, I asked my local city clerk for an accessible absentee ballot so that I would not have to go to the polls because I don't know if you can hear my phone talking right now. Um, 
I'm sorry, my phone is reading a message to me. Um, so my city clerk contacted me and said there, there aren't accessible absentee ballots available. You would have to have somebody come to your home and fill it out for you because I do live alone. And then have another person attest that they watched this person fill it out. And hmm. anyway, taking away all privacy. So I filed a lawsuit in federal court and named the Secretary of State of Maine as a defendant, as well as the city clerk in my town. And then I had three other plaintiffs join me. And so they're in different cities. So their city clerks were also named as defendants. And just this week, um, we confirmed that for the general election in November, all blind and visually impaired or other print disabled people. This is not just blind and visually impaired, but those with paralysis or tremors or other issues will be able to vote absentee ballots online that are completely accessible because we've tested them. And they will also be able to submit those ballots electronically, which is a huge step beyond some of the steps that other states have tried to take to, um, to make somewhat uh, accessible absentee ballots. So we are thrilled with that. You know, it's interesting. It's sort of, you, you, you have a, a guide dog leading you and now you're also leading the way for a lot of people yeah. behind you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, trailblazing. Um, yes, exactly, exactly. I think we have, enough time if there are any questions, um, if you have questions for any of the panelists, or if the, the three of you have questions for each other. Um, I see one, one has just come in. Um, is there a difference when you place a dog with someone totally blind versus someone partially sighted? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. I can speak to that, certainly. So I think that there are unique challenges to individuals that have any amount of remaining perceivable vision and those without any remaining vision at all. The guide dogs are actually trained to the same standard regardless to whether or not they will be placed with an individual that has or does not have any amount of remaining vision at all. And remaining vision is a a loose term that can, you know, be anything from any amount of light perception to silhouettes or shadows and perhaps anything in between. But um, I actually do find that working with individuals, and this is a personal anecdote, but um, working with individuals with remaining vision oftentimes allows for um, it gives the handler the opportunity to give the dog um, more opportunities to get into troublesome situations, <laughs> whereas working with uh, individuals with no remaining vision, um, they typically will not give that dog any opportunities to get into what might be otherwise avoidable, um, easily avoidable uh, situations to to avoid get, letting that dog get into an unwanted situation. So what that might mean is like, how that manifests in the real world is like um, small things like persistent sniffing, sniffing on leash, sniffing while in harness, things like that. Um, it does seem like sometimes um, people who have any amount of remaining vision um, can't, can allow that dog to, to practice an unwanted behavior, un, un, not on purpose, but it's just something that sort of happens. But again, that's an anecdote and it's certainly not the rule of, of thumb. Um, but as far as the guide dog training goes and the training of the individual, there's really no significant difference uh, between the training that we give an individual that has vision any amount of remaining vision or does not. So. That's a great answer, thank you. Um, we, we have a question for Phil. 
how do you tell Phil, how do you tell Chloe to go somewhere she has, you or she has never been before? Good, good question. Usually it's somewhere where, because I can't see it, somewhere I haven't seen before. <laughs> so going into familiar places is pretty easy, but it's almost like, a, uh, as Chris mentioned, it's like having a little bit of sight because I know where I am, I'm familiar. I may not listen to her. I might think I know where I am. So going somewhere totally new, I feel 100% comfortable. I trust her. You know, we were at a, a store today where she hadn't been to. And in like, you know, find inside, we go inside. Find the escalator, we find the escalator. So having the trust of the dog allows me to go anywhere new without worrying about it. So I, I'm never concerned. I actually find it more adventurous to go somewhere new and see how she does. <laughs> where she takes me. <laughs> if, she, if she hears a, smells a hot dog truck, she might verge a little bit. <laughs> But um, yeah, that's not a problem. I, I prefer going somewhere different and letting her do her work. This, this is for, for both Lynn and Phil. Mm -hmm. What would happen to your day-to-day -day life if you found yourself in need of a, if you didn't have a service dog and you needed a, a successor dog mm -hmm. and you had to wait for an extended period of time, how would your life be different? Lynn, please. Um, well, <clears throat> Uh, I own my own home, and for me, it is location, location, location. I'm walking distance to my bank, to my primary care provider, to the pharmacy, to the grocery store. And if I did not have a dog and had to wait, uh, it had to work with a cane, I would have to make a whole lot of arrangements for rides to the grocery store or to the doctor's office or to any of those uh they're not necessarily day-to-day -day, but <clears throat> frequent outings that i rely on uh doing independently with my guide dog and that Similarly. would be thing a lot on a lot of other people mm -hmm. So it would, it would very much shrink your, your mobility and your independence. Absolutely. One, one other question. Um, now, that you, now that you're with your, 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 now that you're a team with your Fidelco dog, what do you look forward to most in the future? Lynn? Me? Good question. Yeah, okay. Who yeah, was the question? Go ahead. Lynn. Okay. Let's first Lynn and then Phil. Okay. Well, um, I look forward to continuing to um, enjoy my independence with my guide and um, not having to rely on my family and friends for those mundane activities. I also still hope to pursue other bucket list things. Uh, actually, nothing's coming to mind right now. But uh, also to, uh, as our world goes back to a, a normal and we're able to have more social functions, I did used to travel to the annual conventions. And I have a daughter in Georgia to go back, fly back to Georgia to see her and continue the, the, the long range travel that we can't do right now, but I'm certainly looking forward to resuming that when the time is right. Phil? Uh, same, uh, I'll echo her sentiments with respect to being without a dog for a year or so. I think that would totally turn my life upside down. Although again, I'm capable with my cane skills, but it's, it, it's night and day having the dog. What I'd like to do with her, you know, the travel is it, you know, the last well, 10 months have been difficult between the winter and the pandemic, but we're ready to start traveling again and attending more conferences and functions throughout the country, if not the world. Um, so it really is endless. You know, whatever I want to do, I know that Chloe is capable of, you know, being with me and doing that. I don't have any concerns, traveling, flying, uh, subways, trains, buses, any, anything, uh, we're good to go. We're, we're gonna try and take one more question, I think. And this one's really for Chris. Chris, how do you match the personality traits of the dog with the personality traits mm. of the person? 
Yeah, what a great question. So, you know, one of the most important aspects of our job here at Fidelco as trainer instructors is matching the right dog that has completed the guide dog training program with the right accepted and waiting applicants. And there's a lot that goes into it. So, you know, be, before an individual uh, that receives a, a guide dog from Fidelco, they go through a long and arduous application process. And part of that application process is an in-home interview with a trainer instructor. So that part of that application process ha means that a trainer instructor like myself will come out to the individual and interview them in their community. And uh, we are going to gain a lot of data points there. We're going to be looking at uh, what kind of environment will the dog be working in? Is it urban, rural, um, or otherwise? It, do they ride public transportation on a regular basis? Do they have other dogs or pets in their life? Um, all, all these data points are going to inform our decision-making. That preferred speed of walking is a really particularly important data point as well. So after we complete that interview, uh, that's going to be what we are relying on heavily when making the correct match with the dog that is coming up in the training program with the individual that is accepted, accepted and waiting. Uh, so what we're looking for is a dog that is going to have personality attributes that uh, coincide with the environment and lifestyle of the accepted and waiting applicant. So it really is a sort of matchmaking game. Yeah, and, and to that point, I know that it can be frustrating for a lot of us because here at Fidelco, it, it is not a first come first serve basis. So, you know, for example, an individual that applies and is accepted and waiting for six months uh, may by chance be serviced before an individual that is waiting for a year. And the reason for that is because it's not a first come first serve basis. We're really looking at the attributes of that particular dog that is available now and the accepted and waiting clients that we have available to service. Um, so it's, it's very much a, a very nuanced and a case by case sort of uh, situation where we're we're looking at um, you know that person's life and lifestyle and the attributes of the dog available. Terrific. If if everybody can hang out for just one more minute, there's one last question that I'm going to try and get to. Someone asks, did the stay at home because of the pandemic adversely affect the dog skill the dog skill sets, or did you not see a change? once you were able to get out again. Yeah, I, I can see a change, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Bill, go ahead. That's funny. No, she, she snapped right back into it. Um, we had to do other things to keep busy, but she snapped right back into the travel and the, the work. Lynn? Um, we're not going to as many places as we did before the pandemic because the restrictions are still in place, but I make it a point to work Grayson every day, not only in harness out on the streets and, and doing a different route each day. I don't want him to just think, okay, we're gonna go six blocks here and then five blocks there and then back six blocks. It's always a different route. Um, but I also uh, do training in the house as well when he's out of his harness. Um, just, you know, some basic command training to keep him on his toes. He'll set up. Yes. How, how about Chris? Is it, it... Yeah, you know, one thing I would just mention is, you know, between our incredible staff and volunteer base, we are very fortunate in that we've been able to not just continue training guide dogs and keeping uh, their skills set sharp, um, preparing them for placement with individuals when we can get a green light to resume traveling on a large scale. Um, but the uh, pandemic, I think, has afforded us some unique opportunities to actually do some you know, incredibly detailed e evaluations and preparations with some of our dogs that we otherwise wouldn't have had the opportunity to do. 
you know, some of these dogs that are, are finished and available to be placed with applicants when we are given uh, the authority to do so have uh, been able to have really, um, you know, mo much more in depth and, and detailed and nuanced training um, with them by living with professional trainers for an extended period of time. And, and if anything, I think we're um, more prepared than ever. <laughs> so we're that, looking sounds, that sounds amazing. Listen, I, I want to thank Lynn, Chris, and Phil for joining me here tonight and for sharing your stories. I know it meant a lot to everybody listening. I also want to say that, um, you know, Fidelco has depended for, it's actually 60 years old. This is its 60th anniversary. And they've always depended on the generosity of donors and where Fidelco is very grateful for all of the support that has made all of this possible. I also just want to say in conclusion, you know, it's interesting that the pandemic came up because I was thinking we've all talked a lot about resilience and the kind of resilience we all need to get through it. And I think, you know, just listening to, to Lynn and Phil, you sort of see that resilience is not only just picking yourself up after you've gotten down, knocked down, but dreaming of a whole new mountain to climb, both li literally and figuratively. So it's been a real honor to spend this time with you. I wanna thank everybody at Fidelco for making this possible. If anybody has further questions, you can send them to info at fidelco.org. And on behalf of all of us, thank you for spending part of our, your night with us. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.